So as you already know, um, that global ev events of climate related disasters have become more profound in recent years. And as a result, more attention is being given to climate justice as you're uh, witnessing in this weekend's conference. So I'm a professor who teaches courses on climate justice here in upstate New York on the traditional homelands of the Onondaga peoples. But I've also lived and worked on three continents. And I bring a background of both natural sciences, social sciences, and working in public policy to help me with my research, with my activism, with working with groups and students, but also in my teaching. So when we start talking about climate justice in my courses, there's a lot of young people uh, like you or slightly older, depending on your age group, you know, who've been really feeling profound stress or anxiety around it. But what I want to try to get my students, and I hope you'll do this as well, is to recognize, you know, understand what it is that we're actually talking about and why it is so important to at the same time recognize that it is uh, something that you can work on and you can work on it with others, but and that you're not alone. So let me just start very methodically. I'll keep my comments fairly brief, as I told the organizers. And uh, then I do want to open it up for conversation. So when we talk about climate justice, it's a term that's been used a lot in the last couple of years or even longer. It kind of exploded onto the scene actually about 20 years ago. I mean, people were talking about climate justice at the UN uh, conferences, at uh, the people's movement. So it's it's been around for a while, but there's still some murkiness in terms of what it actually means. So what using the word climate justice as opposed to climate change means that we're talking about how climate change is an ethical and justice issue. It is not just a science issue. It is not just a techno-managerialistic economic issue. It is those things, but it is also an ethical and justice issue. So what it does is it moves the conversations and debates beyond just talking about the science of climate change, which is really important, but then looking at also the, how it's been discussed historically and what are the historical, contemporary, spatial, and intersectional outcomes of those climate impacts. Right, so what happens when climate changes? <clears throat> so, and many of you are probably uh, familiar with this already, that climate change is talked about as a climate, like as a threat multiplier. It often gets talked as a climate threat multiplier or as a risk threat multiplier. So what the word climate justice or the understanding or the ethics and working around climate justice means is fundamentally paying attention to and then working on how climate change impacts people differently. What does this threat multiplier do? What does it look like, right? How is it uneven? Where is it disproportionate? And what are the resultant injustices? And then how can we redress them in fair and equitable ways? So you can't just say climate change. Sure, we understand the science. We're beginning to understand it better. We're looking at the impacts. But then the justice component means paying attention a little bit differently. And we know the research has shown that climate change has had very unequal and uneven burdens across play, places and over time, where we've seen what we now call a planetary crisis is one there's, it's a common but um, differentiated responsibility. This is a language used by the United Nations framework on the Convention of Climate Change in 1992. So 20 years ago, it's called a common but differentiated responsibility because not every country, country, community, or individual contributed equally, but some have been paying a, the, a steeper price for longer while others have paid different prices or not at all. So what we have seen through research and through um, learning from people around us is that his, histories of colonial and imperial exploitation made a lot of the countries across the global south or the developing world more vulnerable to climate impacts, not just because of where they're located, but, became, but because they were made to be less able to handle some of the outcomes and the impacts. And they've been enduring more egregious and longstanding climate breakdown patterns, um, also from their geographic location, but resultant from the fact that 
They also have less capacity to negotiate in, let's say, climate negotiations and trade treaties in terms of participating in the global economy and so on. So what has come to be known as climate apartheid speaks to this concept of how globally, when we look at it as a global issue of climate justice, we see that there's an apartheid of communities who've contributed least but have been paying a higher price the longest and then therefore unduly burdened and harmed with the inaction over halting climate emissions. And then there are countries and communities who've been spared some of the harm um, and not in such a high level, but we're slowly seeing that that's shifting as well. So what every time we talk about climate justice, I want us to recognize that it is an approach, but it isn't an intentional process. It is an intentional process that involves carefully analyzing these issues, analyzing the uneven distribution of climate impacts, and then how best to address them. So climate justice as an approach draws attention and focus to investigating who benefits, who loses out, in what ways, where, and why. So, right? so it's all these Ws, who benefits, who loses out, in what ways, where, and why, and then what can we do about it? So what it does is I have employing a climate justice approach exposes the root causes uh, and then starts to address and dismantle them systemically because there are systems and structures in place that have kept the climate injustice or the climate breakdown or the climate crisis spiraling out of control. And a lot of this means addressing things like fossil fuel dependency, reconsidering um, endless models or capitalist models of growth, endless growth, but on a finite planet, right? Um, challenging non-participatory democracy, resisting ex um, extractive exploitation of natural resources and communities that help maintain those resources and ecosystems. But at the same time, it also involves other things like international negotiations, collectivizing with other people and so on. So what a climate justice approach does at a wider, at a national or international scale is it encourages people in power, like policymakers, but it also encourages citizens to approach climate change in a more comprehensive way through a climate justice lens. So this is what I've been talking about for a long time. I teach courses on climate justice. So these are some of the basic fundamentals we deal with. But it also therefore means to employ a climate justice approach is to look at addressing these issues or understanding them that are historical and spatial and intersectional. And what an intersectionality means is looking at the way that overlapping systems of injustices collide. So that could be classism, racism, sexism, ableism, and so on. But it can also mean about based on citizenship and national identity, right? If you think about climate migrants, who are fleeing one country to go to another, how have they been treated with xenophobia or unfair immigration policies or outright violence and death, right? So these are other forms of injustices we also need to talk about. So as a result, some scholars and um, even policymakers have started talking about something called climate reparations, which means recognizing and taking the ex um, uh, acceptance of responsibility for the harms that have been done over time and space, and then configuring out what can we do about it. Is it climate financing? Is it a forms of you know, mobility justice for climate migrants? Is it dealing with loss and damage for communities and adaptation finance for re, uh, regions? You know, is it figuring out just energy tr transition? So what does this just transition look like? Uh, can we reduce fossil fuel dependency in some places? Or should people have the right to at least grow a little bit their economy so their citizens too can have three meals a day? But it is about how can we allow that while decarbonizing? How can we think about growth models but recognize that well-being isn't always tied to endless capitalist growth. It is about also therefore rec recognizing the importance of agroecology, um, bringing down greenhouse gases, um, you know, pursuing degrowth models, right? You can still maintain well-being under a degrowth model and recognizing systemic wastage can no longer happen, but also addressing the fact that we are humans and humans make up systems. So we need to address issues of hyperconsumptions, local infrastructure, policies, energy uses, build, building uh, material, all of those things, right? So it's the local and the global and these things intersect. 
So what's really interesting for me uh, to see is that young people like yourself are galvanizing around the world on climate justice, and they're doing it together, but they're also doing it in other ways. So they're working in community, uh, they're working with various organizations, but here's the thing. The thing to remember is that you're not the only young folks worried about climate change, right? Folks in other countries and communities have been who have been dealing with climate breakdown for decades have also had young people who have worried about, studied about it, talked about it, you know, been involved in various youth groups or activist organizations to work towards climate issues in whatever ways they can, they could and they can. It's much easier for your generation because of the internet, uh, ease of mobility, ease of communication. But if you think about a few decades ago, it doesn't mean that there weren't young people who weren't involved because I too was one of those young people decades ago, where I remember I got to participate at the UN conference in 1992 for the Children's Earth Charter, for the Earth Summit, the Rio Earth Summit, where I remember meeting, back then it was Senator Al Gore, um, and he's now, he's made a very well-known documentary called Inconvenient Truth. So what I mean to say is that there have been young people, maybe not as galvanized and as well-organized, but at the same time, I want us to recognize that it is important to therefore reach beyond ourselves and work with other groups and people. So from my activism when I was a youth, I ended up being a teacher, right? Because now I help educate other young people. So they're therefore able to learn the theories, the empirics, the policies, and learn, and then they're able to see those wider connections, the processes involved, and that know that they too are not alone because you are not alone because you cannot go it alone. The climate justice movement means you can't do it alone because no one single person can accomplish it all. No one single leader can accomplish it all because you have to work with other people. You have to be open to constant learning and evaluating because you don't know everything. You will know more every year because you will educate yourself from life learnings, from book learning, through degrees, through working with other people, learning from elders and so on. But the first part is active, uh, collectivizing and being activated to act, right? Because you have to keep doing something. And this is really important, right? This is really important to collectivize. But another really important thing is to talk about it. As we keep talking about it with everyone we know, we also keep learning and hearing ourselves. And we learn from others who may have questions, who may have pushback, who may have other things and say, hey, did you know about this? Or have you read this? And that keeps us moving forward, right? So we have to keep learning, collaborating, and doing more, both ourselves and with other people. And part of that is the talking part. So it's the doing and the talking. And then lastly, to get together to see what you can learn from each other from elders, from different communities everywhere, from community groups in the place you live, or if you're not happy with community groups where you live, learn from other groups, learn from organizations, both small and large, and work in your community to figure out what you can do, because you can't jump in and do something global. Not everyone has that kind of platform, right? Um, what you can do is try to figure out what is possible. What is one thing I can do today? What is something, else that somebody else is doing that I can help with, lend support to, uh, you know, help them do something better. How can I get involved? So again, so it's that learning, talking, growing, and doing, right? You have to keep doing this because ultimately it's through that collectivizing, through that solidarity building and encouraging more people to keep learning, growing, talking, doing, um, and reframing um, an adaptive mindset or a justice-oriented mindset um, and a mindset that enables you to be open to new possibilities, new opportunities that helps you continually grow and critique and reflect. So an important last part of this is being critically reflexive. Think back, reflect on what you've done, what you've accomplished, what more you can do and be open to criticism. It's not always gonna be easy, right? But you have to keep learning so that you are therefore equipped to hold your own in an argument, in a debate. So people can't just sideline you but recognize you're not gonna go this alone because you will work with others to apply pressures to governments, to lobbying groups, to corporations, to bigger organizations, right? For changes and shifts that are really necessary. And what I wanna conclude with is basically saying that do not get overwhelmed because it is in the acting and in the doing 
that how you be, build hope. So remember this, hope is an action verb. You got to do something. You got to act. You got to move your butt in order to get more hope. Give yourself more hope. Give hope to other people. And the more you do, the more you accomplish, the more hopeful you become and less hopeless, right? If that makes sense. So it is about goal setting, but it is also mindset setting. So I want to kind of end there on those points. And I know I've said a lot of things in a very compressed time, but I just did want to end on that positive note that you should not feel eco grief or eco anxiety. If you do, that's okay. Once you start working with others, you start to recognize how that slowly starts to calm down. Give yourself grace, give others grace, and keep doing something. Keep talking about it. Keep growing your mind. Keep growing your heart because you're not going to get out of this alone. And wallowing in self-pity is not helpful for anybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sultana, that your remark on hope really rings true with me and I'm sure a lot of our other experienced youth in the room. Uh, we have about 15 minutes with Dr. Soltana remaining. Uh, I want to open the floor first to questions from our audience. If you want to put them in the chat or private message them to me, uh, we'll ask those to Dr. Soltana. But I do have one that I got from your speech that's a bit more personal. Um, I've been, you know, I'm a student. I've done Model UN here in the U.S. and I know Wissal has too. And you noted that communities and countries in the global South affected by imperialism and colonialism have been affected so much deeper by the climate crisis. And you noted that a lot of structures have kept the climate crisis spiraling without effective solutions. Um, do you see the UN in its current state as one of those structures? And I mean, <laughs> uh, do you think it's something worth continually investing in for international climate collaboration? Um, well, the UN is what we've got at the moment. So until we build a better system, we have to work with the systems we have. So it's a question of how do we work with the system we have and then what better ways can we improve what we're trying to do? So I know like back in November at the COP26, there was a lot of sense of dejection, a sense of we didn't get enough done. We should have been able to accomplish more. Why were there all these roadblocks? Um, recognize that also compared to prior years, how much more vocal a lot of the concerns that countries across the global south were raising but had been silenced, they were much more loud. So a lot of young people from around the world picked up on what was being said from the 1980s, 1990s, from countries, you know, like Marshall Islands or the Caribbean or Bangladesh and so on. So frontline communities and countries have been talking for a long time. Sometimes they're heard, sometimes they're not. But this time we noticed that a lot more other people from larger scale platform people, young people, NGOs, activists, well-known scholars, um, even some policymakers, you know, they were much more open to hearing, but then they're also much more vocal about these issues. So we can still work within the system, even if we feel like it's not as effective as we'd like it to, but we can see where the leverage points are um, and then see what the bottlenecks are. So another thing that was also raised in at the COP26 is how the fossil fuel industry was the largest uh, uh, what is a delegation at the COP26, right? So they're a vested interest. So we shouldn't take that lightly either. Um, so to recognize, okay, what can we do about that? What are the things we can do as individuals, but as collectives to figure out uh, how do we have these kinds of conversations? How do we not allow the greenwashing to happen or what's called green gaslighting, right? You're being told something, you're given a little bit of hope, it's dangled in front of you and then it doesn't come through. Or what are the ways you can change? So, you know, you can get politically involved. Participating in your democracy is really important. Why is it that we have such apathetic U.S. voters in the U.S.? You know, how can you write to your politician, to your congressman? How can you organize something so you are able to put that kind of political pressure? You know, how, what are the changes you can make into your own lifestyle, in your school, in your own community? So I have my students do an activity. What are the things they can change and where are they facing barriers? One of the largest barriers there is they're living in dormitories or in rented apartments where they cannot change their energy system, right? So their energy, the electricity they use or the gas they use in their stove 
is a huge contributor or the fact that the US doesn't have public transportation, very good system of it. So they're driving cars. So what are the things they can do? So some of them are vegan. So they've reduced some you know, of their ecological footprints but there are other things that are systemic and institutional that they feel helpless to change. But there are different ways they can apply pressure. They can work with other groups. They can choose to vote with their wallet if they're able to switch out to different forms of energy or uh, rent somewhere else or own a home in the future or somewhere else or build different Differently, but at the same time, they can also get involved, right? So it's not just you, yourself, and your household. It's about you, yourself, and seeing yourself in other people. So this is what I mean by seeing yourself in broader institutions and then collectivizing to apply pressure to those institutional flashpoints. Because institutional shift can happen, even though it's slow, um, but sometimes it can be revolutionary. It's a question of like, can you bypass some institutions like the UN or should you, or how can we make it more effective by bringing on other actors um, and other um, voices or, or changing the narrative. Thank you so much, Dr. Sultana. We, in fact, have a few voices from the Youth Cop this, here this weekend who I absolutely heard, uh, have seen their speeches and were so incredible. Um, yes, all right. Uh, we have a couple questions beginning in the chat uh, from Brahma. I want to know about the action part more because even after planning everything, we often back off taking, taking action. How can we improve on the action part? All right, that's an excellent question, thank you. So one of the things is the action, the doing part can seem daunting or you get paralyzed with fear and then you don't do, right? Because yeah, I noticed part of your question was backing off from action. Sometimes it can be because you're discouraged or your actions have been thwarted or derailed or somebody made a negative comment. And yes, keeping hope alive is hard. So what you can do is make small actions. You work with others because the best way to keep accountability is to not just do it yourself. When you try to just think about your own action, it is hard. Maybe you have a partner, maybe you have, you have a group and then you say, okay, what are we doing? How are we feeling? What can we do? What can we work in another group? How do we grow our group? And even if you feel like you're stagnating, then we get creative, learn. You have a great opportunity to learn from various resources online. Maybe somebody is doing something else. Maybe they're working with, uh, they're collaborating with an indigenous group in their country, or they're learning from different scientists. They're not just listening to the dominant talking heads or they're figuring out, okay, in our community, uh, this is one source of waste, food waste. Get involved in distributing food. Get involved in encouraging people not to waste food. Uh, you know, these are just small steps and they're not very um, huge in the grand scheme of things, but you can also do other things like letter writing campaigns. You can figure out what are the different fossil fuel divestment acts? What are the different ways that you know, agricultural bills pay, play a part. Agriculture is a huge component of the climate crisis. And if we keep subsidizing agriculture in the US, we are fueling some of those issues, right? How can we stop, let's say, open coal pit mining or mountain top blasting, right? Those kinds of things. So there's frontline activities you can do like literally with your body and your feet, right? You go show up and others you can do through your brain, through letter writing, through the word, through voice. But you, so you have to think about action as not like this big massive thing. Small things add up, small things every day add up. And it's find inspiration from other sources. If you're feeling like you're not doing enough or you're feeling malaise or you're feeling too much anxiety, um, figure out you know, an accountability partner, you know, get the help you need, work with other groups because it is when you witness that there are children who are walking 10 miles a day to fetch water and they're living through the climate crisis, you start to check your own privilege very quickly, right? So recognize all of us have relational privileges. All of us can do something. You know, just absolutely wallowing in self-pity should not be an option. And it is that apathy which has led us to this problem. We have to get more people to care. We have to get more people involved because otherwise it may be all of us walking 10 miles to fetch our drinking water. Thank you, that was so powerful. Oh. Alrighty, we have another question from Anaya. I have always struggled with taking in everyone on board as the response isn't always as huge as I expect. This discourages me. I also get discouraged by people's attitudes towards climate change and it prevents me from taking steps. How can I make my voice heard when there are no ears who listen? Yeah, I used to feel like that a couple of decades ago. And I was like, well, I'm a nobody from 
a small country, no one's going to listen to me. But the whole point is you do what you can with what you have, and then you do some more with the new things you've got and do more, right? So you may feel like somebody's not listening to you, but there's always somebody listening. So you could uh, start doing a blog. You could start making, uh, you know, um, some sort of collective writing project. You could start making different materials. Maybe you just need, you need to educate people in your own community. So you can figure out um, how to deal with that discouragement um, and recognize that discouragement is natural. You're going to have fluctuations. This is life. It is hard right? It is only going to get harder as you get older. Like as you become an adult, you have more responsibilities, your frustrations can compound. How do you think I've remained hopeful for all these decades? I refuse to feel hopeless. I turn my climate rage from decades ago into climate action. A lot of this is teaching because I can reach larger number of group faster and better every semester, right? So it is through that education where I'm re-educating people not to think about climate change just as a science issue or something just about reduce, reuse, and recycle, but to broaden it and then to figure out, okay, what can we learn? What are the different things? Can we, for instance, maybe you can learn more about the global Green New Deal. What are the ways you can get involved? Maybe you can learn about, you know, climate justice alliances domestically and internationally. Uh, figure out what are the ways students can contribute and help. Do you have skills like translation? Can you take an hour to write, do a letter writing campaign? Can you go help participate in something locally or virtually? Uh, you know, there, there's always something to be done. The whole point is to recognize you might feel helpless. Um, and then again, you, you still keep at it because it is through the doing that hope grows. It is not through just feeling, waiting for hope to arrive. And yes, recognizing some days you will feel hopeless and you'll feel really discouraged. It's okay. Then you get up the next thing you do it again. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is such a strong message for all of us. Uh, we have a question uh, from Miriam from Georgia. Miriam, would you like to unmute? Hello. I'm so happy to be here and I'm from Georgia, if not the United States. So Georgia is a flexi country, if someone don't know it. I am joining here from the warmest of it, Felicity. Maybe someone from you have been in my country or if not, welcome. Uh, personally, I would like to say that I have been listening a lot of stories and a lot of inspirational notes, but tell you, I will lie if I tell that before I have listened to real action done uh, lectures or speech as your dear Fahana. And what I wanted to say that I am here happy because I really was listening to the talk, which I myself sharing this attitude and these values. Why? Because you mentioned that climate change, it's not about recycling. Climate change, it's not about the economical crisis or scientific crisis. It's more about complex. And this is too, I'm sharing this because um, I was part uh, as of COI 16 as a climate uh, use uh, statement from Georgia and I wasn't able to go to Glasgow, but I was online. But what I found myself even in my country that, mm, yeah, maybe Georgia not directly affected by climate change because we are not like um, uh, as, as a indigenous community like who's really affected by climate, but we have our part to play for climate change by our industries and so on. And I saw that um, a lot of, uh, I will not mention name by names, but I see the people organizing conferences, talks in even my country and focus badly on general, just for talks or for money or grant. And I start thinking like this, that, uh, okay, what would be better real make changes if our country could focus on the behavior, on the steps, how they are making impact on the global climate change and play their role to change something starting from their country's example and from the actions. For example, if in Georgia, uh, like uh, 
uh, transport can be green uh, to lock down the emission. We can work on this topic, but not taking the broadly, which is not possible. And I see a lot of steps. Of course, I agree with you. Everyone can do what they can, how they can to do influence, but not everyone just uh, feel what they do because they are following the topics because it's trendy. Of course, it's also have its positive side, but when I was looking at this coming from the scientific background, I, I imagine that, okay, if we will follow up only to the action, which is trendy, and we will speak from trend to trendy, then I thought that this would not be able to help something. I think all of the resources when we are in a critical situation have to switch on to the real steps and actions. And I saw another part that there was a good question about that when you do action and nobody believes to you, nobody follows you. And uh, I know it's longer, but I will finish uh, soon. Um, I want to say that people just uh, like to follow people who have a lot of likes, to, who are famous. But you know, a lot of, um, as you mentioned, uh, talented people stay outside. They do very interesting blogs, the real action highlight. And even in my case, because I went through it and I understand to use, I, I find myself in your words. Like I myself felt it's a hopeless to do some actions, but yeah, how yeah. to catch up with this everything and real spend our resources for the real actions and even if you are the, from the developing country as me, and always looking for any opportunities, mostly voluntarily, because I'm mostly engaged voluntarily from Georgia to the online community. And what I it can be done more effective from people who are not directly um, directly influenced by the climate actions and are from the uh, countries who are far from the uh, like uh, on the other continent which is not yes. close like in the middle thank, thank you, you very Maria. much how can we influence countries that are not feeling the effects of the climate crisis on such a deep level from countries that may be or countries that are traditionally less influential on a global stage Sorry, was there a question in there because the sound cut out for a bit i couldn't quite yeah, follow what was happening yes um is there what's the uh, or how can smaller countries, countries with less influence on the global scale, impact and connect with uh, larger countries and communities that may not be feeling the effects of the climate crisis on such a deep level? Uh, oh, okay, all right. Um, sometimes the small uh, small countries band together, so then they have a collective platform, um, but then they also work um, bilaterally between different countries, so you don't have to always wait for one big imperial power to listen to you, right? So we're getting into the realm of like geopolitics and international relations, and there are a lot of things that happen in the background, right? There, there are ways that countries cooperate and then not cooperate, but as we've seen that uh, sometimes small countries can be very, um, you know, powerful in sending out messages. They'll do, uh, I'll give you one example, for instance, um, whether it's effective or not, whether you agree or not, the prime minister of, um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting his name, of the Maldives held a cabinet meeting underwater many, many, many years ago in a suit with oxygen tanks. He met his cabinet underwater to make the point. So it was a visual shocker, right? So it was a stunt but it was a stunt to get attention. And then he was able to talk about small island nation states, what's happening to countries that are losing their homeland. So small countries may be facing different issues as well. So, but if you're talking about like landlocked, slightly more powerful countries versus landlocked, slightly less powerful countries, it's a question of how do they cooperate, collaborate or conflict. Um, but at the same time, we don't have to only rely on um, government heads, right? There are different ways that citizens and students and communities in those countries can also collaborate and cooperate and work behind the scenes to then apply leverage and pressure. And I think this is what's in interesting is that more and more smaller countries that weren't really feeling it or didn't really care, or even large countries that weren't really 
paying attention or didn't really care are paying attention and caring because its climate is now so fairly disrupted that it's not only just affecting countries in the tropics and subtropics or countries largely in the developing world, but more in the advanced industrialized world or those that are fairly close to it like Georgia is. So you know, we can think about countries that cooperate in conflict, but then we can also think about organizations, communities, you know, um, citizens also working together behind the scene. But also remember countries can come together, but they can also work bilaterally and then they can work the UN system. Thank you, thank you. Yes, there's so much power in collectivism and solidarity. All right, I know Dr. Sultata, you have a very busy schedule, so we will have to wrap things up here. Thank you so much for joining us and offering your wisdom to our group as our opening keynote. We're so thankful for your time and for all that you do. Um, everyone say thank you to Dr. Farhada Sultata. And uh, if you thank have any you. information you'd like to share or any content or work you'd like to share, you can put it in the chat or email it to us. We'll, um, well, thank you everyone for joining and sticking around. I know I've said a lot of things, but you know, if you're, if you're interested to learn more, you can go check out my website. I just put the link in, in the chat box. Um, there's a paper there that came out uh, in 2021 called Critical Climate Justice. It is being used as a teaching tool in many college and um, university courses. So I don't know what um, age group folks are at here, um, but it's also being read by you know, wider groups. If you're interested, you can download my publications from my website. Um, there's also podcasts and, and video recordings. It's under something, I think it's under news and engagement. I can't quite remember how it's structured, but you know, I welcome you to, to visit, to take a look, but you know, I will leave with the, the, the comment that the only way to get yourself out of hopelessness is to educate yourself read more, read widely, read deeply, talk with other people, right? Work with other people um, and figuring out how, what you can do from where you are with the privileges you do have. Thank you, Dr. Oh. Sultana. That's Thank it. you, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good day. You as well.